we will hear from two witnesses, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and Judge Kavanaugh. Thanks, of course, to Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh for accepting our committee's invitation to testify and also thank them for their volunteering to testify before we even invited. Both Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh have been through a terrible- She's sitting up very straight. She's taking hard swallows and she keeps scanning the room quickly. She's got her head held high. So it contradicts the scanning and the nervous look, which should tell you at that point that it's an act. Every step of the way, the Democratic side refused to participate in what should have been a bipartisan investigation. And as far as I know, on all of our judgeships throughout at least the last four years or three years, that's been the way it's been handled. After Dr. Ford's identity became public. I keep seeing her do it. She keeps opening her mouth and closing it, opening her mouth and closing it. When I see that, I'm, I instantly think something's wrong mentally. There's something neurologically wrong with her. What it is or how bad it is, I have no idea. I can just tell you when I see that from someone, I mentally think there's something wrong with you because that's not normal behavior, especially since it's coming off subconsciously. My staff contacted all the individuals she uh, uh, said attended the 1982 party described in the Washington Post article. Judge Kavanaugh immediately submitted to an interview under penalty of felony for any knowingly false statements. He denied the allegations categorically. Democratic staff was invited to participate and could have asked any questions they wanted to, but they declined. Which leads me then to wonder, if they're really concerned with going to the truth, why wouldn't you want to talk to the accused? The process and procedure is what the committee always does when we receive allegations of wrongdoing. My staff reached out to other individuals allegedly at the party, Mark Judge, Patrick Smith, Leland uh, Kaiser. All three submitted statements to the Senate under, under penalty of felony, denying any knowledge of the events described by Dr. Ford. Dr. Ford's lifelong friend, Dr. Ms. Kaiser, um, stated she doesn't know Judge Kavanaugh and doesn't recall ever attending a party with him. My staff made repeated requests to interview Dr. Ford during the past 11 days, even volunteering to fly to California to take her testimony. But her attorneys refused to prevent, present her allegations to Congress. I, never, I nevertheless honored her request for a public hearing so, so he's reading the statement out and he talks about the other people writing statements and that her best friend writing a statement, lifelong friend, says it never happened. And she gives a nod and a positive and continues to go. And then he brings up the attorneys, you know, flying her, getting this, you know, so it was a formal way of doing things, someone to interview her. And she just looks over there. Not a, nothing surprising, nothing. Oh, I didn't know that. And this is important for later because I already watched this whole hearing. Because at the very end, and we're going to skip to that. Um, did anybody ever advise you from Senator Feinstein's office or from Representative Eshoo's office to go get a forensic interview? No. In so should we see her there? She thinks, goes through no. memory. No. Instead, you were advised to get an attorney. And she's going stiff because the rest of this time at this supposed hearing, she's got pretty pose. We'll go over pretty pose, or at least pretty pose in this later. And take a polygraph. Is that right? Many people advised me to get an attorney. There's pretty pose. Head down, wrap the eyebrows, do a little wave. Um, once I had an attorney, my attorney and I discussed using the polygraph. And then we're twisting our chair because we're cute. And instead of submitting to an interview in California, we're having a hearing here today in five minute increments. Is that right? I, I so she looked towards the committee for that question, which tells me that that answer, the true answer came from that, that her attorneys weren't involved in that, that the true power behind where to have this at was from one of the committee members. I agree that's what was agreed upon by the collegial group here. Okay. Thank you. 
I have no further questions. Okay, uh, I have something to submit for the... And that made her extremely nervous, comparatively speaking, on the rest of her testimony. Because now she's gone back with her, ten, her chin tucked into her neck because she knows that's bad. ...record. We received uh, three statements under penalty of felony from three witnesses identified... And now she's gone in defiant. I'm going to sit up straight, head held high, throw my glasses on top of my head. ...by Dr. Ford... Mark Judge, Leland Kaiser, and Patrick S Smith, all three uh, denied any knowledge of the incident or gathering described by Dr. Ford. Without objection, I'll enter in the record. And then more pretty pose with a defiance. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, something for the record as well. Uh, a number of letters from the witnesses, family, friends, including her husband. Okay. Uh, I'll get to you just as soon as the ranking member. Mr. Chairman, I know her, it softens with other letters coming up that support her. My point is she's using emotion to manipulate her testimony. Pretty pose to this more defiant look. So we see in the beginning, we're going to look real small, give a little bit of a little, I'm listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's real hard. Mm -hmm. And then we see that by the end of it, the real comes out when these things are brought back up again, the letters, and it's more defiance and stress. Proceed, please. Thank you, Senator Grassley. I think after I read my opening statement, I anticipate needing some caffeine if that is available. Okay. Can you pull the... We're going to sway back and forth. We're going to have a smaller voice than what is normal. We're going to make ourselves small, and we're doing the little pretty... It's cuteness. It's, that's what it is. It's cuteness. I'm doing pretty pose. I'm going to use emotion to make you sympathize with me. I'm not coming off as a big scary bear or a Medusa. I'm a soft little church mouse telling you about the evil kitty outside. I was pushed from behind into a bedroom across from the bathroom. I couldn't see who pushed me. Brett and Mark came into the bedroom and locked the door behind them. There was music playing in the bedroom. It was turned up louder by either Brett or Mark once we were in the room. I was pushed onto the bed and Brett got on top of me. He began running his hands over my body and grinding into me. I yelled, hoping that someone downstairs might hear me. And I tried to get away from him, but his weight was heavy. Brett groped me and tried to take off my clothes. He had a hard time because he was very inebriated and because I was wearing a one-piece bathing suit underneath my clothing. I believed he was going to rape me. I tried to yell for help. When I did, Brett put his hand over my mouth to stop me from yelling. This is what terrified me the most and has had the most lasting impact on my life. It was hard for me to breathe. Well, I'm listening to this. And she's putting her neck down into her chest. So that she sounds like this. And it comes out real croaky. This is a prepared speech. That later she tells you she wrote herself. No one helped her. So she's gone over this. Reread it. Practiced. And has really figured out how to sound kind of croaky. So that it sounds like there's mucus there. And that's practice. Because if there was any mucus there, for as long as she's going on, and for as traumatic as she says this is, we should not only only one hear it, but she should be lifting her head up to fight it from coming out. And we do not see that. We see a position that she's forcing her voice to sound as if she does, with no evidence of it. This is a manipulation tactic. And I thought that Brett was accidentally going to kill me. Both Brett and Mark were drunkenly laughing during the attack. They seemed to be having a very good time. Mark seemed ambivalent, at times urging Brett on, and at times telling him to stop. A couple of times I made eye contact with Mark and thought he might try to help me, but he did not. During this assault, Mark came over and jumped on the bed twice while Brett was on top of me. And the last time that he did this, we toppled over and Brett was no longer on top of me. I was able to get up and run out of the room. Directly across from the bedroom was a small bathroom. I ran inside the bathroom and locked the door. 
I waited until I heard Brett and Mark leave the bedroom, laughing, and loudly walk down the narrow stairway, pinballing off the walls on the way down. I waited, and when I did not hear them come back up the stairs, I left the bathroom, went down the same stairwell, through the living room, and left the house. I remember being on the street and feeling an enormous sense of relief that I had escaped that house and that Brett and Mark were not coming outside after me. Brett's assault on me dra drastically altered my life. For a very long time, I was too afraid and ashamed. By the way, later in the same testimony, she testifies that her friend Leland gave her a ride home. Aimed to tell anyone these details. I did not want to tell my parents that I, at age 15, was in a house without any parents present, drinking beer with boys. I convinced myself that because Brett did not rape me, I should just move on and just pretend that it didn't happen. Over the years, I told very, very few friends that I had this traumatic experience. I told my husband before we were married that I had experienced a sexual assault. I had never told the details to anyone, the specific details, until May 2012 during a couple's counseling session. The reason this came up in counseling is that my husband and I had completed a very extensive, very long remodel of our home, and I insisted on a second front door, an idea that he and others disagreed with and could not understand. In explaining why I wanted a second front door, I began to describe the assault in detail. I recall saying that the boy who assaulted me could someday be on the US Supreme Court and spoke a bit about his background at an elitist all boys school in Bethesda, Maryland. My husband recalls that I named my attacker as Brett Kavanaugh. After that May 2012 therapy session, I did my best to ignore the memories. If that's true, and it's hard to tell from this, but she's just acting and she's reading what she's practiced because the allegations themselves don't hold water because she gives herself away later and throughout. Psychologically, it would be very interesting to see what kind of person this individual is on a normal basis and not just this. She is a psychotherapist and apparently does psych research. I find it very alarming that when it comes to this kind of thing, she claims that she doesn't know about victims and memories and the best way to get information from them, nor does she know about polygraphs and the psychology behind that. That is her profession. Well, we are not going to watch this whole thing because this is like nails on a chalkboard. There's only so much of BS I want to watch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I use my five minutes of questioning, um, I thought that I'd, I'd try to remind my colleagues, and in this case, Miss Mitchell as well, that... Uh, uh, now, she just got over her traumatic reading where she was talking, and it was coming out really croak-like, and she's got a lot of mucus, and she's so upset. So after you get through that, if you've got that much mucus in you... Where is the tissue? It's just more evidence that that whole, <gasps> it was so traumatizing and I needed, was a bunch of hooey. Uh, you have my five minutes to ask questions. Sure. I already know it. You guys don't like this woman because she didn't go in pit bull. Come on, she's a prosecutor. We're not gonna watch this whole thing. But I'm gonna point out some things that she was doing and then we're gonna go directly to the end where that little bit of pit bull came out. Because if you're ever gonna get anyone out of someone that you believe is lying, well, you first have to make them relax. And this lady did a very good job at that. She let her hang herself, gave her all the rope she needed. And that was what her job was. Give her all the rope she needed. Good morning, Dr. Ford. Hi. I, we haven't met. My name is Rachel Mitchell. Nice to meet you. I just wanted to tell... Now she's gated, and I'm talking about the prosecutor. She's anchored herself down. She's given a reassuring smile. She's done this before, obviously. That's why they picked her. I'll tell you, the, the first thing that struck me from your statement this morning was that you were terrified. And I just wanted to let you know, I'm very sorry. And she did a jerk on that one. It's like you're terrified, and then she jerked back. 
and that her head like wobbled. It is an unnatural thing for her to do or say. That sympathy to someone that you're not believing. But alas, she's very good at her job. And even though you guys don't like her because she didn't bark at them with her teeth bared, sometimes there is such a thing as licking someone to death. Um, that's not right. And we saw the, the stress smile. Um, I know this is stressful. And so I would like to set forth some guidelines that maybe will alleviate that a little bit. Um, if I ask you a question that you don't understand, please ask me to clarify it or ask it in a different way. When I ask questions, sometimes I'll refer back to other information you've provided. If I do that and I get it wrong, please correct me. Okay. And you see how she's relaxed? Ms. Ford is very relaxed because our prosecutor has done her job. Was it written it seems, on or about that day? Uh, yes, yes. I traveled, I think, the 26th of July to Rehoboth, Delaware. So that makes sense because I wrote it from there. Okay. Is the letter accurate? I'll take a minute to read okay. it. So I'll, I'll, I can read fast. And there comes Pretty Pose again. I'll take a minute to read it and swing back and forth, wiggle in the chair, because we're being cute. It's Pretty Pose. I see. And do you have that second front door? Yes. It's, it, it, and and yes. it now is a place to hope. It's Pretty Pose again. We're talking about claustrophobia and a second front door. Pretty Pose. You see this a lot from her throughout this thing. Oh, we're not going over every detail. Nails on a chalkboard. The attack itself. Um, it, you are very clear about the attack. You're being pushed into the room. You say you don't know quite by whom, uh, but that it was Brett Kavanaugh that covered your mouth to prevent you from screaming, um, and then you escaped. How are you so sure that it was he? Uh, the same way that I'm sure that I'm talking to you right now. It's our just basic memory functions. Um. A little bit of the pretty pose, the cuteness. What is cuteness? What is the pretty pose? For her, is to distract what's coming out of the mouth. I'm cute and I'm pretty, therefore believe what is coming out of me. It's a manipulation technique. It's almost like hypnotizing. You're using your attractiveness and your smallness. It's like a little kid. Adults biologically want to protect and believe little kids when they're saying something very heinous. So if you act like a little kid and give those cute little pretty poses, you're more or less going to be able to bypass someone's normal radar of bull and have your story believed. That's just how it works. It sucks that way, but yeah, that's how it works. Was there any other um, music or television or anything like that? Because that I was watching her eyeballs. Because so far, I haven't seen anything go to any kind of visual memory. She uses a lot of emotion, and that's about it, which in and of itself is not good. I expect if you have a memory, even if it's just a little one, there's got to be visual memory and there's nothing. So she starts at one side of her eye and then she goes over to construction that lightly touches visual memory. And you get it in that area of the brain. It means you're pulling visual memories of things you know, not actually of the scene that you're being asked to paint. If I ask you to tell me what your bedroom looks like and you have a construction area when you're telling me about it and it's your bedroom, I would be very suspicious that you're describing actually your bedroom. One thing in any trauma victim, regardless of anything, you're going to remember the scene of the crime. You may not remember anything else. You may not remember how you got there. You may not remember how many perpetrators were in the room, except for the ones that are physically doing something to you. But you're going to remember that room. You're going to remember the covers. You're going to remember the blankets. You're going to remember color. That would be normal. To remember nothing but the bed was over here, that's telling. And she's claiming she only had one beer. Of course, the others are claiming there was no such party. So then would it be fair to say at least PJ, Brett Kavanaugh, Mark Judge, Leland Ingram? At and she did it again. She's asked specifically on people. And she goes to an area of your brain that has nothing to do with the memories, it was actually like the doing part. Like, oh yeah, what did I write down? That's who, that's who it is. The time mm -hmm. and yourself were present and possibly others. And one, one other boy. So there were four. There were so that, it is, that really bothers me. You're supposedly giving out information 
of the people there and you don't have any visual memory of them. You have the doing part come out of your brain. And the only thing I can ascribe that to is where she wrote them down in her little testimony paper, whatever she wrote it down in. (sighs) But don't pay attention to that. She's got pretty pose. She's cute. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Four boys, I just don't know the name of the other boy. Have you been contacted by anybody saying, hey, I was at the party too? No, I haven't talked with anyone from that party. Okay. She had a, she had just an access brain moment. It was too close to doing to be at anything else. That kind of makes me think that they're looking, actively looking for others to cooperate. And if you can't find anybody to cooperate it, it doesn't help. The three of you were inside that room. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, at some point, do you recall it being turned down? I don't remember if it was turned down once I was leaving the house. I don't remember. Okay. Likely, since I could hear them walking down the stairs very clearly from the bathroom. Okay. And the bathroom was sure. door was closed when you heard this, is that correct? I could hear them very clearly hitting the walls okay. going down the stairwell. Um, in fact, in your letter, uh, you said that they went down the stairs and they were talking with other people mm-hmm. in the house. Correct. Uh, were you able to hear that conversation? I was not able to hear that conversation, but I was aware that they were downstairs and that I would have to walk past them to get out of the house. Okay. Now, let me make sure we're on the same page. Were you not able to hear the conversation or not able to understand the conversation? I couldn't hear the conversation. I was upstairs. Okay. How do you know there was a conversation? I'm just assuming since it was a social gathering, people were talking. I don't know. Okay. In I your letter, hear them you... talking as they went down the stairwell. They were laughing and. Okay. In your letter, you wrote both loudly stumbled down the stairwell. At which point, other persons at the house were talking with them. Mm-hmm. Does that ring a bell? See, she is a good prosecutor. She's given her enough rope. Calm down, people. I would describe it as somewhere between my house and the country club in that vicinity that's shown in your picture. Okay. And the country club is about twenty a 20-minute drive from my parents' home. A 20-minute drive. And, mm-hmm. of course, I've, I've marked yeah. as the crow flies. Yes. Um, would it be fair to say that somebody drove you somewhere, either to the party or home from the party? Correct. Okay. Has anyone come forward to say... She had no memory on that. ...to you, hey, remember, I was the one that drove you home? No. Okay. Um, In your July 6th text to the Washington Post that you looked at earlier, you said that this happened in the Mm mid-80s. In your letter to Senator Feinstein, you said it occurred in the early 80s. In your polygraph statement, you said it was uh, high school summer in 80s, and you actually had written in, and this is one of the corrections I referred to early, and then you crossed that out. Um, Later in your interview with the Washington Post, uh, you were more specific. You believed it occurred in the summer of 1982, and you said the end of your sophomore year. Yes. Um, You said the same thing, I believe, in your prepared statement. How were you able to narrow down the time frame? I can't give the exact date, and um, I would like to be more helpful about the date, and if I knew when Mark Judge worked at the Potomac Safeway, then I would be able to be more helpful in that way. So I'm just using um, memories of when I got my driver's license. I was 15 at the time, and I I did not drive home from that party or to that party. Like I said, I'm using memories, but she doesn't go to memories when she says, I got a ride. Not even the quick to it. Nothing. There's no memory. Let's continue. In your um, statement, you said that on July 6th, you had a, quote, sense of urgency to relay the information to the Senate and the president. Did you contact either the Senate or the president on or before (laughs) July 6th? No, I did not. I did not know how to do that. Okay. There's pretty pose again. And then she looks away. I, I didn't know how to do that. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. It tells me that that's not true. And if it is true, she didn't even bother finding out. Are you aware that, and you know, I've, I've been really impressed today because you've talked about norepinephrine and cortisol and 
what we call in the profession um, basically the neurobiological effects of trauma. Have you also um, educated yourself on the best way to get to um, memory and truth in terms of interviewing victims of trauma? For me, interviewing victims of trauma? No, to, oh. the best way to do it, the, the best practices for interviewing victims of trauma. She's got a doing memory. No. And she says no. She knows. It'd be weird if she didn't know, considering her profession. I'm so done with this woman. You know what it looks like through all of this? This looks like a professor got together with some of her liberal friends to take down Kavana. Oh, you went to school with him. You said you were sexually assaulted. Yeah. How do I say this without getting caught in perjury? And you just let the pieces fall where they may. Because she didn't say anything in this that could perjure herself. Because she kept saying, I'm not sure. I don't remember. All I can tell you is where the bed was. No visual memory of anything. Nothing. If you liked it, leave a like. If you like the content, please subscribe using this link via specific feeds. You'll be sent notifications to the full length videos and ones that can't make it to YouTube and you won't mysteriously be unsubscribed either. There is now a video course available on her website for gold subscribers where Mandy teaches more about her techniques of deception detection. There's also other content such as the crime series, an interesting mind series and monthly podcasts available to both gold and silver subscribers. If you like it, please share and subscribe. Thanks for watching.